Hello and welcome to the Eco Modernist Channel Live. I'm Carl Pauls. I'm joined by Gabe Ignetti, Chris Bergen, and we're joined by Mike Stassi today, who's from Australia and writes about the philosophy of degrowth. Welcome to the show, Mike. Could you tell us a little bit Thank about you. yourself and the subject of your writing? Well, I don't just write about degrowth. I write about all sorts of things. I, I started life as a civil engineer, and then I got sick of that, so I became a professional photographer. And then I got wiped out by the economy when it crashed in 1990. So I retrained in renewable energy technology because I thought at the time that renewable energy would save the day, which I now realise it won't. I also learned that the best way to combat the, all the issues that we've got regarding energy is actually to, to go energy efficient. And so I started a, a, or tried to start a business designing energy efficient houses, but the, the housing industry just wouldn't have it. And, uh, and I just gave up in the end. And, and now I'm, I'm actually living in a zero energy house and we don't heat. Uh, the, the temperature in this house is 20 degrees Celsius plus or minus two all year round. Where do you fall in terms of things like densified housing and mass transit and dense scale power generation for the cities? I don't think cities have a future. It's, it's because of this degrowth thing. Everything is starting to fall apart now. And it's because of uh, resource shortages. For instance, what, one of the first things that we're likely to run out of is copper. You know, people talk about all sorts of other resources, peak oil, and I mean, I'm, peak oil has has happened. It happened in November 2018. But we have so little copper left that to electrify everything is impossible. In fact, most of what people think is going to happen is impossible because of resource constraints. A good friend of mine. He's also Australian. He's someone you might want to um, interview at some stage too. His name is Simon Mitchell. He's a mining engineer and he's, he's got degrees in physics and mathematics and, and he's got a PhD in something. And he's working for the Finnish government at the moment. And because he's paid to do all this research, he actually has managed to do a lot of research. And he's the one who's told me that you know, copper is going to be a real issue. But there's all sorts of metals that we're going to run short of over the next two decades. Some of them we're going to be running short of this decade. And so a whole lot of things to do with electrification of, of everything, which is what people are talking about, it just can't happen. We don't have the resources to build all of the high-tension transmission power lines, for instance, all the transformers because and all the electric cars because they all, all need copper. You know, the, the, An average gasoline car has like five kilos of copper in it. An electric car has 300 kilos of copper in it. There's a huge yeah. difference. Like the consumption of, of resources that go into all this high-tech stuff is quite unbelievable. And like if people don't even realise, you know, like my laptop, it takes 250 kilos of fossil fuels to make it. All this stuff has to be mined, transported from all over the world into eventually one place where it's put together. Um, the, the resource consumption of, of all the stuff that we use is just unbelievable. When you look into it, would there be an alternative to computing that you would endorse, or is compute? Are we sort of locked into computing as a part of our lifestyle? Well, it's a huge part of our life now. I mean, everyone's got a cell phone, and a cell phone is a computer. In fact, yeah, the progress in computing, you know, in the last twenty years is absolutely phenomenal. I've, I've even written blog posts on my blog with my with my phone. You, there's very little that you can't do with a, with a mobile phone, um, they're so powerful. I mean, if NASA had a mobile phone back in, 19, in the 1960s when they launched men to the moon, they would have done a better job because, it, it, you know, <laughs> a mobile phone today has way, way more computing power than what they were using in, in, in 1969. <laughs> you said that we, we could not expect renewable energy to save us. Is that only because of copper or do you see other problems with renewables? The problem with renewables is intermittency. The further you are from the equator, the, the more difference there is between the length yeah. of the summer days and, and, yeah, and the winter latitude? days. 
43 degrees south, okay. which is about probably about the same as California, I think. Britain, Germany, all of Scandinavia, you know, Poland, all these places, they're further away from the equator than we are. And so in, in Germany, in winter, you can forget about renewable energy. It just, or particularly solar, uh, it just does not work. It's just incredible the difference between summer and winter. At the moment, because the, because of the war in Ukraine and they're not getting Russian gas, Germany's burning coal like there's no tomorrow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In fact, it, that's happening all over the world. The, the, there's an increase in coal consumption everywhere. And I think some of it might have to do with the war in Ukraine. And I think what's happening is that as there is more and more penetration of renewable energy, there's actually less and less net energy available to the grid. And so when they run short, they start burning coal. There's a huge problem that, we, that we're facing now, and it's, it's called the net, what I call it, the net energy crisis. It takes energy to get energy. So to yeah. get coal, you have to mine it. You know, to get oil, you have to drill and, and so on. There's an energy cost. So the energy cost of getting energy has been rising for 50 years, actually, since, since 1972, roughly. At first, it's imperceptible. You know, it's, it's like an exponential curve. You know? so, so things start here, and then they slowly they, they go up and up and up, and then they, then they skyrocket like this. And the net energy problem is doing that now. We're, we're on this up, upward curve where the problem is getting worse and worse. It's, it's taking more and more and more energy to get the energy that we need. And what's left, so for instance, 100 years ago, if you had a barrel of oil, 99% of the barrel was available to do things with. But now we're down to 80%. So 20% of the barrel of oil is needed to get the barrel of oil. And that's getting worse and worse significantly now. Because it's, it's a 50 years, a right? That's what, I, that, that, that's what I've heard. Yeah. 50 years. And, from- and so... I remember when I started learning about peak oil 20 years ago, we were producing something like 85 million barrels of oil a day. Now, we've, well, it's because of COVID and everything else, it's been all over the place. But, but you could say that we're producing about 100 million barrels of oil a day, 100 million barrels. But out of those 100 million barrels, only 80 million are available for doing work. And that's less energy than we had 20 years ago. And the thing is, Almost nobody seems to know this or understand it. And so they're calling it inflation, but there's no inflation. We've got an energy crisis. I, I recall when I first got into peak oil and the, the different alternatives to peak oil, it was biodiesel was one proposed solution. Uh, and that when you invest into like palm tree, you basically get five parts energy out for every one part you invest. So an EROI of one to three to one to five, almost as good as as oil today. Uh, unfortunately, there's other problems with exhaustion of land resources. Palm trees have taken over hmm. parts of Southeast Asia and we have massive deforestation. The IPCC projected that would we would need land mass equal to all of Ontario north of the 49th parallel in order to satisfy our energy demands from biofuels and biomass. And that's the 2018 SR15 report. So, of course, biofuels is possibly a partial solution if you don't count uh, the resource exhaustion the land that we're missing <laughs> the competition with food sources and, no. and the, the problems uh with particulate emissions which kills people so this yeah. is absolutely just, just that that's a yeah it's it's all terrible. that's all no problem <laughs> Yeah, I definitely feel you on the energy crisis. I think that was around 2006, 2008 for me when I was into the the peak oil and the peak oil solutions. Of all the discussions I had back then, and I was a big biodiesel fan, the only argument that I couldn't answer was, well, we should use nuclear and electrify instead. And that's sort of where I find myself today. Uh, It is sort of a combination of 
nuclear energy efficiency and uh, it, is is this a path compatible with degrowth uh, i know that australia it's not available to you but is some amount of clean baseload or clean dispatchable energy combined with degrowth a solution in your view degrowth is baked in the cake it doesn't matter whether you like the idea or not it's yeah. going to happen for several reasons actually uh, so uh, apart from this problem that we're having with energy and resources we also have an economic problem uh, and see this is where i'm quite different from most people is because i see the big picture so for instance when the financial crisis hit and oil hit 147 dollars a barrel i actually thought that's it this is the big crash that, that i've been expecting since 2000 uh it's all over but what happened was that they started printing money out of thin air at unbelievable rates to keep the system going. By the way, the, the reason that they want to keep the system going is that all the super rich people in the world, they own our debt. So I don't know if you, under, if you people understand how the economy works, right? Money is created out of thin air and then it's lent to people who then invest that money into growth the money to repay the debt and the interest at any time does not exist. So we have to have right. more money created constantly so that you can repay the debts and the interest. And to do that, you have to have growth. It's the only reason that the authorities all over the world are saying jobs and growth, jobs and growth, jobs and growth. Mm -hmm. it's, because, yeah. it's because otherwise all the debts collapse. Now the rich can, people, can you know, can the, the Bill room. Gates and the yeah, all all the really rich people in the world, they own our debt. If you're in debt, then you've got a liability. But the people who lent you the money, for them, it's an asset. So our debts, the people's debt, is their asset, and and that's how they're worth squillions. Like the likes of Bill Gates is only as rich as he is because. All the poor people in the world have borrowed bucket loads of money, right? And so all that stuff's been invested into things that he, he's into, same with you know, Elon Musk and Bezos and all these people. All the money, all their wealth is fake. It's all fake money. That's why they want to keep the system running. That's why they have to have growth. Is It's so that they can remain super wealthy. Mm -hmm. And... Yep. Um, there's absolutely no other reason why we need to have growth. Growth does not improve our standards of living or any of that sort of stuff. Now, the, the problem now is that the debt level is so high, it's just mind-boggling, actually. I just cannot get my head around how much money people owe. It's a call on future growth. It's a call on future resource use. So if, if there's no growth, the debts cannot be repaid. There's no way known that the debts will ever be repaid. So something's got to go. Something has to give. Someone's going to have to wear the consequences. And, and so we're going to see debt cancellation all over the place. I mean, even Biden is already talking about cancelling some student debts in America. And, and, of course, all the rich people are up and up saying, oh, you can't do that, you know, because it's our money that you're going to right off basically because if you cancel the debts that money just disappears so some wealthy person somewhere is going to wear it they're going to lose billions i mean it might be shared between a whole stack of people but billions of of, of wealth billions of dollars worth of wealth will disappear and so if, if you want to have all this eco modernist stuff you know if you want to build all these nuclear power stations where's the money going to come from because see all money comes from debt it's it's created as, as debt. I want to provide a perhaps an alternative, and that is the eco-modernist vision. Of course, the progress of science has led humanity to produce more and more capabilities. We have vastly exceeded our evolved traits, and we have brought nature with us. We've improved the traits and the productivity of food. We've invented modern medicine. Uh, we have energy sources that are tens of millions more dense than burning wood. And we have concentrated ourselves in an urban landscape that permits hundreds to thousands of people to live in a square mile. Now, of course, 
the 8 billion people that have resulted in that progress brings with it a risk that we will grow beyond the constraints of our opaque system. And I think that humankind's salvation to avoid the perils of growing beyond these limits lies in the application of technology. So the added peril of our own societal conflicts will not be solved by rejecting technology or returning to feudalism, but instead in forward progress. And that when we grow more connected and mutually supportive, we will grow, grow beyond the crude limits of evolution and subsistence living. At the same time, we must consolidate humanity's footprint so that we can make room for the return of evolved biological diversity. Now, the only question is, how do we do it? The application of DNA sequencing, the use of nuclear fission, and densified housing and agriculture is the core of the blueprint for human survival in the 21st century and beyond. And that's where I think eco-modernism has led us. An evidence-based philosophy that shows the development of science and society and provides hints at what will come with us into the future. I have real issues with your vision of, um, of food, actually. Okay. Be um, because, I, actually, I, I was watching some of the stuff on your, on your um, uh, channel recently and, and there was all this uh, enthusiasm for GMOs. I don't actually have an issue with GMO as such, except for the fact that everything that's GMO is sprayed with glyphosate. Glyphosate now is so prevalent, it's in mother's milk. Nearly all yeah. women have, have glyphosate in their milk. And this generation of kids born today is apparently going to die probably before their parents will because they're exposed to all these chemicals. Um, so I personally aren't going to, am, am not going to be eating any GMOs because they, I've cut them out of my diet. They're poisonous. They kill you. So you've, you've brought to us a little bit of data that requires some validation that GMOs, while you don't have a problem with them, GMOs lead to the overuse of chemical, and let's be specific, you mean industrial chemical compounds. Yes. Like industrially produced organic chemical compounds, which you predict will kill children. And let's look up the uh, glyphosate as a compound of phosphorus, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Well, anyway, it's it's been clearly shown to uh, affect people's health. It hasn't. And there's, uh, what, what, well, I actually have a data on that. Uh, Any, look, I can cut did, data on that? I've seen enough about it that I'm convinced that I, I wouldn't eat anything that's GMO. Back to my fundamental question. When we return to subsistence farming and we have small-scale tussles over resources... How do we avoid returning to this very crass and crude tribal warfare? Is this really a, fut a, a vision for the future of humanity? Look, I, I don't know. I, I'm not convinced that when the system crashes that there's going to be complete mayhem. Well, there might be in the cities, actually, which is why I left the cities. Because yeah, when you have people too close together like that, that that's when you have... Yeah, uh, problems. Yeah, that's why. Like that's that stuff. But I, I don't also, know. You know, my wife. Yeah, let me let me say something there. My my wife uh, just came back from Peru. I don't know if you've been watching the um, mm. the news there. They're blocking roads and everything. They want more democracy. They want uh, nationalization of resources. But the, the whole purpose of all of that, and this is a peasant movement. You know, it's the workers and peasants. You know, that's not just, you know, people in the cities, you know, people in the countryside a lot. And they are very upset because they want to have a better lifestyle. They want electricity. They don't want this kind of future that you that you speak about. And and I think the same is true everywhere. I mean, I hate to put it this way, but I have to. It's kind of a, priv a Western privileged view because we really don't grasp uh, how uh, hard it is to, to be a peasant and how precipitous it is too. I mean, 
I know you live a low tech style and everything, but you have access to modern medicine if you're sick. If your if your crop fails, you, your kids will not starve. You you're gonna be all right. You know these people don't. <laughs> see, they need to. This, you know they need to do that, better. You know they need to. See you. you yeah. You the problem in in what you just said is the crops. Because that's the problem now, I think, is that we rely on crops. So the question is for you again, Mike, how do we craft our bodies into something that will survive for a hundred years without modern medicine? Well, I reckon the first thing you do is you abandon grains. Because if, yeah. if you abandon whatever it is that makes you sick, then you're going to be healthy, aren't you? It's as simple as that. To a limit, <clears throat> to, to a degree, yes. No, 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 no. Now, look, on the subject of of of, um, in, of um, cholesterol, okay, the food you eat doesn't give you cholesterol. Your body makes cholesterol. I've done a lot. I've, I've studied this to death. But anyway, this Tasmanian doctor, this guy, I'd never heard of him before, he said that there was a study that was done um, of people who are in Okinawa, it was Okinawa because they, they've been studying Okinawa for a long time because people there, a lot of people there live, live a long time. I know. Live a long time. Long well, yeah. they've worked out that the people with the highest cholesterol were the ones who lived the longest. And, and none of the people on Okinawa who were vegetarians lived beyond 100. All the people who lived beyond 100 all ate uh, protein and fat. Right. right, and and it's now, the fish oils, and so let me correct that. I, I I mistakenly said whale oil. It's it's fish oil, but still we have fish oil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we we will have the problem with eight million people, and I I I know you love your diet, but but we're here to sort of compare and contrast. <clears throat> yeah, but see, we're talking about we were talking about production. GMOs. And, uh, yeah, well, but no, it, the, it doesn't the, matter. The food, it, the it, food it, production it, is a real problem. No, oh, I, actually, I think I, I think that GMOs is the solution to this. If you say, "Well, we need no. we need more, uh, you know, f fatty oils. We need more fish oils, like the people in o Okinawa consume." Well, then the question is, where do we get it? And so, with eight billion people, you're not going to get fish oil enough for all no. of us. We'll deplete no. the oceans. And so, the answer is to have intensify agriculture, farmed fisheries, and bio-derived and precise fermentation that produces these fish oils that we need in order to survive. And so- well, the omega-3s, omega-3s. Yeah, yeah omega-3s. So just to make it ultra right. clear, there's the one solution that allows for 10 billion people to inhabit the earth, and the other wants to contract the population to a billion or less. Is that right? Well, I don't think anyone is actually working towards contracting the, the population down to a billion or less. But that's well, exactly well, you think what's it's going a to happen. Consequence. So, is that the fact? What is what is going to be the final population of Earth after the coming eco-social catastrophe? Okay, I I've been following this guy for some time. He's, a, he's an American. His name is Jack Altman. He's an engineer with several engineering degrees, but he's also got a PhD in uh, complex system uh, analysis. He reckons that the population by 2100 will be 600 million people. And and they will nearly all live near where... 600 million? Yeah. 600 million. For where? Well, most of them will live near hydroelectric dams. Oh, you're talking about like uh, after the, uh, the big crash, we're going to yeah. reduce to 600 million. No, we're not going to Whoa. reduce it. N nature's going to do it. <laughs> Nature, see, it. right? I know that. See, see, when when you run out of fossil fuels, you know, we go back to where where we were before fossil fuels, and on top of that, we have degraded farmland to such an extent that it's impossible to grow anything without fossil fuels. You can have GMOs all you like, but you can't make glyphosate without oil. You can't make nitrogen fertilizers without gas. You can't harvest the crops without diesel fuel. And diesel fuel is going to become a real problem this decade. Like, there are already diesel shortages in America. 
There are diesel shortages in Europe. They have literally stopped making nitrogen fertilizers in Europe because they haven't got enough gas. And if you haven't got those things, it doesn't matter whether your crops are GMO or not. They're not going to happen. Yeah, but they don't. They don't frack in Europe, though. I tell you. For a different reason, I looked at uh, Our World and Data website uh, a couple of months ago, and according to the trends that they are seeing, the world population should should max out about 2060, mm-hmm. 2065, at about 10.2, 10.4 billion people, and then we'll we'll start going <laughs> down in population. They were expecting in the early 2100s, it would we'd probably be dropping about 10 or 12 million people a year on the planet just because people are having fewer babies in general. And I think uh, most of us here know the work Robert Hargraves, among other people, has done with his book, Aim High. When people have a middle income type of existence, plenty of food to eat if they want it, plenty of electricity if they want it, which doesn't mean you can't cut back on electricity like our guest has done but since when they have an option for their future if they want to go to college if they want to be a mechanic if if they want to be a politician they when they have options they plan for their future and they plan for how many children they will have and uh in general the world population has greatly slowed down in the past uh, three decades or so the, the growth of the world population and it's looking like a century century from now will be at or a, slightly above 10 billion, but the population will be dropping slowly. So I was just kind of wanting to get my impressions on that. Okay. None of these things factor in the surplus energy crisis mm-hmm. because the sur- see, we, we are already running out of surplus energy. Uh, when I first discovered peak oil 20 years ago, we were producing about 85 million barrels of oil a day Today, we, well, COVID sort of threw a spanner in the works, but we've been producing lately around 100 million barrels of oil a day. The trouble is it takes so much oil to get the oil that we are mm-hmm. probably only getting about 75 million barrels of, of oil that is actually usable. We're probably consuming 25 million out of those 100 million to, to get the oil. And so we actually have less net energy available for us to do things with today than we did 22 years ago. Right. And with uh, you know, the human population has an imagination, we have knowledge base, we don't have to be locked into oil necessarily for energy source. <clears throat> well, the, we are. Curr- currently, currently we are for the next decade or two. But long term, you know, two centuries ago, we weren't locked into oil. No, but there was only one billion people. We moved into it. Well, it was less than a billion two centuries ago. But yeah, but as we move forward, we we can replace that with other energy sources, which are not so carbon intensive. Right. But all those energy sources utterly require fossil fuels. Like you cannot mine the resources to make. Yeah, they do. No, it's not going to happen. I am 100% certain that it is not going to happen because, for starters, it's the scalability. Like, you know, as I keep saying, we built the 20th century one brick at a time when and where we needed it with, with, with energy that was increasing in quantity and getting cheaper all the time. And now we have to replace the whole darn lot with energy that's getting scarcer, more expensive, and we don't have 100 years, we only have like 10 or 20 years. So no. the size of the task is absolutely monumental. I, Mike, I have to agree with you, actually, uh, c- conditionally. I, I agree with you. If nuclear energy continues to be obstructed, we will never be able to replace fossil fuels. And you're absolutely yeah. right. No <clears throat> amount of... This seven to one EROI biofuel, no amount of one point four to one methanol or uh, you know corn derived fuel is going to replace fossil fuels. As you say, going from a hundred to one in antiquity, or just like literally picking coal out of the ground and burning it, absolute enormous EROI. That's energy returned on investment. On energy investment. Yeah. Yeah, and and this is. 
absolutely shocking to see it plummeting. But nuclear, for 4,000 years, the EROI of nuclear is going to stay fixed at 100 to 1 until we invest in breeding reactors. And then it will shoot up to thousands and thousands of times. So literally, we're talking about an energy source that is created in the merging of dwarf stars... That's uranium and thorium, like some of the components inside our own bodies that only exist because of the merging of stars. And yes, we do have a finite supply, but that finite supply will last us 4 billion years at thousands to one EROI. So there is a path forward, uh, and, and the only thing that is leading us towards destruction is the obstruction of that path forward. I don't think that uh, natural gas, even in 100 years, will run out. And I'll tell you why, because there is so much methane uh, that is in permafrost under the ocean. The Japanese are actually mining it from the ocean, hydrates. The, in fact, the, some climate scientists are very afraid of it, that that, that methane is going to just get totally out of hand. As a matter of fact, in, in the Permian extinction, it was methane that was the cause of the extinction. And it's estimated that we have more methane accumulated than existed back in the Permian period. And that's all energy. And from what I understand, that methane is part of the Haber-Bosch process, right? But you're right about the oil, though. And, and even there, the in fuel production and all of that. There's a good chance of kicking in over that time period, too. So, But see... You're not connecting all of the dots. There are not enough resources on the whole planet to electrify everything. There's not enough copper, right? Um, Simon Michaud, who's an Australian friend of mine now living in Finland and working for the, for the government there, his job is to plan Finland's future for the coming crunch because, it, that, make no mistake, the Finnish government and the Swedish government, they are nuclear powered and hydro powered but the new anyway Simon has worked out that to electrify everything so you're going to need a lot more electric turbines electric motors and all that stuff there's not enough copper to build the first generation right only the first generation of alternatives there's not enough copper and even if there was a current rate of production it would take 180 years to get it out of the ground and turn it into useful stuff like yeah. pipes and, and wires and uh, and all that stuff yeah. it's estimated till like we have to 2040 before we run out of uh, copper right yeah and, that's what the estimate and is. there's a solution to this though and that solution is urbanization because the f the further spread apart we are the more copper <laughs> it requires to transmit energy it's it's a simple fact is Density spread over large distances means that just like the, the inverse square law, just like light transmitting, we need more and more materials in order to transmit this energy over to the entire population. And so going from Finland with 49 inhab inhabitants per square mile to the density of New York with 27,000 <laughs> inhabitants per square mile, we yeah. have the solution. <laughs> Yeah, but don't forget that nearly all the Finn people live in Helsinki. They don't live in the countryside. You know? Okay. The people in the countryside can live as you do with no power. At least 90% of Australians live in the, in the capital cities of Australia. Comparatively speaking, hardly anyone lives in the country. I mean, the, the state where I live, Tasmania is even, it's an island the size of Sri Lanka, uh, south of, uh, of Australia, and there's half a million people here. So population density is very low. I don't like living near lots of people because it's going to get dangerous. Okay. When, the, when the system crashes, like you don't want to live in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane or New York or Chicago or any of these places because that that's where they're going to be. That's very well true. Yeah. Yep. It could be an economic <clears throat> crash. Economic crash. No. There's one other thing about building all these nuclear power stations is that you, you're going to need a lot of concrete, right? And yeah, already, yeah. there's already a shortage of sand to make concrete. The, one of the most stolen resources in India at the moment is sand because there's such a shortage of sand in, in India 
that if there's any any of it stashed somewhere, people will steal it. You, you look it up. Carl's got access to research, I can yeah. tell. <laughs> it's, a, it's it's building sand, you, specifically. Yeah, building that, sand. That's that's sand. You, you, this looks yeah. like it's a problem with production instead of the, the scarcity is caused by temporary lapse in production in India because, of course, India was particularly hard hit by COVID. And so labor plummeted, labor supply plummeted as folks fled the cities and returned to the countryside to avoid the concentration of COVID in 2020 and 2021. And so it, no, it, was a pro it, was, it was a problem before COVID. Now, I want to get back to Carl's point about production. Okay. Because what people don't understand is that all this production is climbing exponentially, right? And Unfortunately, humanity's greatest short, shortcoming is its inability to understand the exponential function. And the reason that we're having problems with production is that because we can no longer keep up with the growth of production. It takes diesel fuel to mine sand. It's not dug out by electric machines. They're diesel electric. We're starting to see shortages of absolutely everything. Yeah, partly it's caused by COVID because a lot of people aren't going back to work. Population growth has fast looking like it's going to be stagnating. In, and I think it's going to start in China. You know? The population in China is getting really old. Like the demographics in China are, are terrible. Like half the population is over 60 or something like that. I not think that bad yet. It's not that bad. It's, it's quite likely. It's getting there. Yeah. It's getting there. It's it, getting there. It's quite likely that millions of Chinese will die of, of COVID. Um, so, you know, I, I have one thing, though. Uh, let, let me just say one thing before we go to that thing. You know, when you're saying about the copper, I think this is based on a false premise because if copper never existed as an element, every metal conducts electricity. It's just not as efficient. And some are more efficient than copper. And there are substitutes. I don't know if you're aware of this story, but the Club of Rome back in the 70s, they predicted copper would run out in the 1980s. No, they didn't. And no, 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 no. Uh, that's, yeah, that is a complete well, myth. I, I, no, 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 no. You see? Oh, okay, so whatever the right. thing was, they predicted that it would go there. No. But fiber optics came along and replaced copper, and their premise was that, and it was a correct premise, that people didn't even conceive of it at the time. And yeah, I believe there's going to be, way better uh, ways of, of uh, moving uh, electricity than copper that are in the works. And, I mean, I could speak to that, but it's not. we've got to have copper. You know? Okay. First, I have to correct you because I know a lot about the Limits to Growth Report and the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome has been misquoted, misrepresented, like you would not believe. <laughs> yeah. When it when it when it came out, no one wanted to know anything about what they were saying because, like, oh, it's anti-progress, you know, like we can't have this. And so people were saying that the Club of Rome had been saying that that the system would would collapse by the year two thousand, or that we would run out of this, or that we would run out of that. None of that. What the Club of Rome actually said, and and there were there were twelve different scenarios, so that they actually investigated every possible avenues, right? So they said, oh, if we had more technology, what would happen? If we had uh, uh, birth control, what would happen? And so they had all these scenarios, and what they what they said would happen is that with that, that no matter what we did in the first half of this century, the system would collapse. That was their prediction or forecast or whatever you want to call it. They never said we, we would – actually, another one is that we were, we were going to run out of gold. Well, you know, they've never said ever. Like it's just not in writing anywhere in those books. They never said that we would run out of anything. That's not what they were saying at all. They were saying that there wouldn't be enough, right? There wouldn't so be they, enough. It's okay. There wouldn't I, be enough. I accept that. Because, because, you know, if, if, you, if you go through resources, they go down. No, they're, they're not going to. They're not. They're not, yeah. they're not replenish themselves, so that they're going to well, go down. I misspoke. I Population misspoke. goes I, I, up. I, I, agree, I agree with you there. Yeah, we have like four hundred years of petroleum, but only uh, the only forty. Uh, what was it? Two thousand and fifty will it be worthwhile to get it out. It's so I meant. That's what I meant. Yeah. I. That's what I meant. I. I misspoke. Yeah, and and you but, can't you can't transmit yeah. electricity from power stations with with fiber optics. You know, fiber optics is like. 
puny amounts of power that, that they can move. Yeah, those are for signaling. Yeah, those are for signaling. Yeah, signal. yeah that, that's, that's not what I was saying. Though, yeah. either. But we did so, use, yeah. use copper for that previously. Yes. Yeah, but the thing is that the amount of copper that's been replaced by that technology doesn't even come close to the amount of copper that, that growth has required for other things. I mean, there's a lot of copper in this house, you know. I, my solar power system is 40 metres from the house and I had to get, because it's because it's such far away, I had to get extra heavy copper wires right. to make sure that I was still getting 240 volts in the house. So, and that's just one example. And on top of that, things like electric cars, for instance, a classic case where a normal car has two to three kilos of copper in it, but an electric car has two to 300 kilos of copper in it. Mm-hmm. There's a huge amount, like it's in the motors. It's, and the inverters and also yes. the cables. Like, you know, if, if you're going to move uh, 100 kilowatts of, of electrical energy, you need cables like an inch thick, you know? It, it I, depends, you know, it I, depends I was on the, last time, which kind of energy is being transmitted. So we're talking direct current power. Electric in energy. Yeah, yeah, direct current. Well, even AC, it, it does. Uh, the only reason that they use AC motors is because the motors are more efficient. Not, no, no, not the amount of copper. Is, this still is very basic science no, no. That, that we know. Yeah. It is that if you put in five, current, if you, three phase power does not require enormous conductors like direct current does. Uh, three phase needs three times as many conductors. So they might be thinner, but you need three times as many of them. Oh, oh no! See, I, I know about electrical engineering. Okay, great. You <laughs> uh, said they're thinner. How, how much? What's the sum? Yeah, but yeah, but there's three of them instead of one. Okay. So and, three and what, times, how much three thinner, times a thin how conductor. How much thinner? How much thinner? Probably a third. Probably a third. Oh, uh, well, okay. It, well, we'll fact check this in post. It's fine. <laughs> I'm actually educated in in uh, in this stuff. One of the things that you learn when, when you study uh, renewable energy is voltage drop and, and current and, and the size cable that you need to make sure that when you're moving electricity from, um, you know, from one place to another that you've got the, the right size cable. Otherwise, the cable burns. The higher the voltage, the smaller size cable you need. So the, inver- the inverter in my um, camper van is, is 12 volts. So I needed cable that's as thick as my little finger, and it costs $30 a meter. And it's because the cost of copper is going through the roof. Um, you know, cop- copper's, I wonder how long before copper's more expensive than gold. Um, and yes, you, you can use aluminium, you know, like they're actually making high tension power lines out of aluminium now, but not just yeah. because. Not just because of the shortage of copper, but it's a lot lighter. So you can have longer spans between the towers because it doesn't sag so much because it's lighter. Well, but of course, my point. And, I mean, and there's, and there's more. And it's, it's gonna, they're going to have better stuff than that, I bet. Like graphene is, is becoming is becoming big. It's just that they don't know how to mass produce it cheaply yet. Okay. Graphite, graphite is actually something else that we, that we can't make fast enough. Yeah, we can't. Yep. No, Friendly. I mean, I, yeah. can see, I can see there being a lot of bumps along the road. But I'm going to tell you this, though. I, ultimately, the game will uh, be uh, infinite resources because... Uh, <laughs> I know where he's going. No, because... Well, I know where he's going. Let's go. I know. <laughs> Space is the place. <laughs> Look at this, right? Uh, did, it, it's been estimated that it, for, for $10 billion... In five years, with the technology we have now, you could build a base on the moon. And I know it's expensive <laughs> to bring stuff back. Well, no, 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 no. Just listen, hear me out. It's, I know it's ex- very expensive to bring things back, prohibitively expensive. But once you set up on the moon sufficiently that you're able to export and live off the land there in terms of resources, you... What it, land? It's, the on land, the well, the, the, the there's no the land on there's, there's no land on the moon. <laughs> there's moon, there's no land on the moon. There's land on Mars. Come on, now exporting it. Check this out. It takes three days once you sit. Once you've got to that point, it, it'll take three days to get to Earth. That's 
roughly the time it takes to cross the Pacific or something like that, it'll take 26 times less energy to do it because the moon is like one third the gravity of Earth, I believe. And once you get off, you don't have to use continuous energy to go all that long distance. You, it just, you just glide into to Earth. So this is very doable and it will happen. It will happen. We will move, uh, we will eventually be exporting copper and everything. And beyond that, our great, great, great grandchildren, maybe even our great grandchildren will be exporting products and it'll be more of a one way thing from space rather than needing to go up and go up and go up. So, I mean, why, why do you laugh about that? I mean, why are you so dismissive of it? Be because you can't do any of that without fossil fuels. No, that's not true. We have that's synthetic fuel true. capability, and, and we're getting thousands of EROEI from nuclear energy. So an 80% efficient transformation of chemical stock, ocean water, into synthetic fuels allows for space travel from nuclear energy. It is, it is yep. a subject we, we covered with G.K. Shriya Prakash on, on the production of synthetic fuels. Uh, it, it is something that is absolutely possible with nuclear energy. I agree that it's sort of distasteful that we continue to produce rockets that are fossil fuel derived. Uh, I'm, I'm really not happy that we're continuing to, to do that without uh, some kind of nuclear produced stock. But that is actually that is a, a transitional phase, I think. Now, rockets are actually not powered by fossil fuels; they're, they're powered by hydrogen. I was right? going to say that. But where's the hydrogen coming from? Fossil fuels. The older boosters is hydrogen and oxygen mix. So it depends which rocket technology you're using. It could come from any electric source. Nuclear it could come from solar farms. It could come from wind farms. It could, any, anything that produces electricity could create hydrogen. See, we are already in an energy crisis. The wheels are falling off, everything. The growth economy, because, you know, we're supposed to be talking about degrowth, the growth economy utterly relies on a growing amount of fossil fuels at this stage. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, yeah. nothing. No, nothing has replaced fossil fuels yet. The, in fact, you know, this renewable energy, bull, the, the, the growth of, of renewables is, I don't know what it is now, but it I can't remember when it was 24% per annum. I mean, can you imagine if the economy was growing 24% per annum? Like people would just be, oh, look at all this growth, you know. But that could not keep up with the growth of demand of electricity, which was only growing at 3%. And that's yeah. because the 3% of a huge amount is a lot. 24% of a tiny amount is a tiny amount. And like I said before, humanity's greatest shortcoming is its inability to understand the exponential function. No, oh, I think we're, and, we're all on board with this. We're all on board with the problem with competing against fossil fuels. And, and I think that we're very much on a similar predicted trajectory without nuclear energy. Okay. Now, look, take France. France is in a really serious energy crisis now. And they're 80% nuclear powered, but a lot of their state power stations are getting old. They, they need repairing. Like some of them are offline because they're so badly damaged that well, they, need, they need to no, spend they're two or three months to fix them. They have an elective inspection and remediation while it's advantageous. While we have our spring thaw they're going to continue to keep to rotate through those plants and inspect and bring them off and online so that they know they're safe. And this is this is not like a, a great conspiracy that a, a nuclear plant only have a, a certain shelf life because every component in a nuclear plant, with very few exceptions, is replaceable. It's, it's like a steam generator. Those are replaceable. All of the piping is replaceable. It's, it's only a very few like concrete components that needs to be very carefully managed and monitored so that it is not falling apart, literally. And we've, we've had a half dozen plants in America stop operating because of concrete fa failures. But every other component is replaceable. I agree. I mean, it's, but see, to replace them, you need fossil fuels. 
You need to mine the okay. resources. That, that, for oh. but, but that's how it works. Anyway, yeah. in France right now, right, they're having such an energy shortage, electricity shortage, right, that this, this is amazing. I only found out about this the other day. There's a baguette crisis. You know what a baguette is? Yes. No. The bread. No? There's thousands of bakeries that are going to have to shut down because they can't get enough electricity to, to bake their baguettes. I mean, France is so small. And so any flights shorter than 200 kilometres are banned. Like that. Yeah. You, that, but, I mean, they've got, they've got high-speed trains there. All the trains are electric, right? So, and and high-speed anything like that uses a lot of electricity. The amount of energy required to move anything is proportional to the square of the speed. So if you go twice as fast, you need four times the amount of energy. So all these trains are going at you know, 200, 250, or even 300 kilometres an hour, but they need bucket loads of energy. Uh, and per person, it's so small. It is. I. I. I'll have to. I'll have to compare it to a a single passenger vehicle, but it's proportional to a per passenger proportional to a car. There's there's no, a bit of a physics no, no, problem. No, it's, it's that. No, no, it's all about efficiency, right? A car right, is less efficient right. than a train. The thing is that nuclear powered France has an electricity shortage because of economics, because of bad policy. Yes. Because of growth, there's oh, too many people no. there now. No, they they have no. not grown in the last ten years. Look, not substantially. You know, population is growing. Oh, resources are falling, and where where the two curves cross over, that's it. The wheels no. fall off. France's public policy was unduly influenced by pro renewables groups that got them to stop doing regular maintenance on the nuclear plants, and that's why. France had to shut down most of the nuclear, or several of the nuclear plants anyway, this past year. That's why they have a, currently have a crunch, is because they put off their maintenance, and now they absolutely have to do it all at once over several nuclear plants, and that's why they have the shortage. If they had had proper policy over the previous five, six years, then they would not have a shortage on uh, nuclear energy in France, or very small, if any, shortage on energy at all across all of France. Okay, can I reply to that? Yes, please. Yeah. The, pro the, the problem was actually that it was privatised. Yes. And private, com private companies put profits ahead of maintenance. And so it was that ED EDF, it's called Electricité de France, it was recently mm -hmm. renationalized. Yes. Yeah, and and I I'm not at all convinced that it was caused by greenies complaining about nuclear power. Uh, well, uh, I mean, I, I, I do agree about the renewables. That. You know, Let, let's cover that in detail. <laughs> so there's there's some things. So in 2013, France passed a law, the Green Growth for Energy Transition Act, and that limited French nuclear capacity to 63 gigawatts. And that meant that the new Nuclear plants that had been under construction before 2013 could not come online until an older plant was retired. So we literally threw away a working nuclear plant on the border between France and Belgium because of the 2013 law. That's number one. Number two, EDF as a private entity was limited in how it could set its prices. It was not allowed to compete with renewables or natural gas. It was forced to long-term power purchase agreements, lowering its profitability, meaning labor, which was at a premium because of unionization, and as, as it is right in France, could not keep up with inflation and other market demands. So it's almost like France intentionally sabotaged their nuclear fleet while it was privatized. So you, you can check out Mark Nelson, Energy Bants on Twitter for enormous amounts of detail on this. It's a very, very compelling story. But yes, you're, you, you could be half right. There is a cost. Every industrial development has a maintenance cost that must be paid yeah. over time. And we owe it to our future to continue to monitor and maintain our industrial resources. And if we don't, they will crumble and decay Private capital will absolutely feed off those whenever they can, but we need to be careful to have the right policies so we just don't abandon societal resources to the private market. 
Oh, look, you're absolutely correct. Uh, you know, I, I think this business of, of having uh, renewable energy attached to the grid is just a disaster. I, I once saw, because I, I speak through in French, I once saw on YouTube this electrical engineer, French electrical engineer, and he said that wind turbines in France are a thermodynamic black hole. They're a thermodynamic disaster. They just don't work, you know. Uh, it's a complete waste of resources, of money and, and, and everything else. Now, you know, you're talking about we have to keep up the, the resources so that we can you know, maintain all this stuff, and that, that's the problem, you see. It, the resource growth cannot keep up, and that's why degrowth, whether you like it or not, is going to happen because we are already hitting the wall everywhere, in the UK, in France, in Australia, and the USA. It's going to cause an economic crash. Because it's if you not don't the have growth that happens. It's, it's not the growth that happens. What happens is that as costs go up, we get more and more efficient and use less and less materials. Um, mm. Carl, I don't know if you had that picture I was going to show. Sure, of, let's, of a, let's do it. Uh, uh, a computer way back when and a, a little chip now. This is the trend. I mean, the cell phone. Do you remember, I mean, when you had to have a, you know, all the things that a cell phone could do <clears throat> you have to fill a room with? Them. I mean, this is this is a trend, you know? And that's how... These I'm, things? Yeah. These things are I mean, a, they're bloody amazing. This is as good as it's going to get. It takes 250 kilos of fossil fuels to make one of these. A quarter of a ton of fossil fuels to make one bloody mobile phone. <laughs> Uh, we will be able to extract it profitably till 2050, you'd estimate. Yeah. And, they, and they've predicted from 19, way back from 1910 that they were going to run fossil fuels and we got better and better and better at doing it, which is the next no. thing. Even if you say 2050, no. it might turn it to 2100. No. Uh, <clears throat> yep. Yep, they did. They did. Right. Sorry, uh, my camera has crashed. So this, yeah. this fossil fuel death spiral, that's what we're going to attempt to escape. And thank you, Mike Stass from Damn the Matrix for being with us. But, Go ahead. By the way, can I say, Damn the Matrix is not D-A-M. A dam is what you put in, in a valley to stop the flow of water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, -A -A my website is called Damn the Matrix, D-A-M-N. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for joining us on the Eco Modernist channel. Thank you very much. Please subscribe to us on YouTube, Ecomodern Channel. Also to subscribe to us on Twitter and Facebook, Ecomodern Society of North America. And online at https.esna.earth.